we now have the panel for this year uh, HPG. And the topic we chose this year uh, with my uh, program co-chair, Hanjo, is entitled High Performance Geometry. And we invited a group of people that we believe are experts on the topic from content creation all the way down to final high performance rendering. Those people who have accepted to participate to this panel and to discuss and exchange their perspective on the topic are Henry Morton from NVIDIA, Jonathan Dupuis from Unity, Ryan Schmidt from Epic, David Farrell from Adobe, and Alex Evans from NVIDIA. And right now we'll have a session split in two. Essentially, during five minutes, each of our panelists will give their perspective on, uh, on the question. And after we'll have a discussion uh, around this, uh, this question of geometry, high performance rendering, and how to, to combine both. One aspect we wanted to emphasize with, uh, with Anjul was to revisit the standards and uh, think about like what kind of uh, new representation could emerge in the near future. And so we asked the panelists to think about uh, two controversial questions uh, that we asked them. Uh, the first one is, is there a realistic path to UV-less graphics and therefore are 2D textures dead? And that echoes a little bit uh, some of the talk we saw today, uh, in particular the one we just saw at the technical paper session. And the second question was, assuming 2D textures are dead, then are triangle meshes dead too? And so they have the, the choice to explicitly answer those questions or just give their perspective on the high performance geometry. The first speaker will be Henry Morton. Uh, the mic is yours. Oh, great. Thanks very much. So um, let's see. Uh, I'm still learning how to do this, obviously. All right. So um, as I said on the on the title slide, I'm giving a hardware perspective, you know, in some sense with a question mark because my background is in software for although over a long career, I've, you know, sort of migrated toward doing hardware design. Um, as Tammy just said, the, there was this interesting question around, you know, where are things going to go? And the first one seemed to imply that if you get rid of UVs, you get rid of textures. And I created all of this slide pretty obviously before the the talk that was just given about HTEx. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of a path forward without UVs, it's some variant of HTEx. And to, to use that or to get rid of UVs, basically, you need something to provide um, texture coordinates basically through some kind of inherent parameterization. So NURBS, subds, um, all of these things probably need some amount of aggregation to get the kind of levels of efficiency that you might need. Um, and these are all kind of descendants of both rays and ironically a, a disaster of a product, um, NV1 uh, from NVIDIA. Um, so, uh, but what about meshes? I mean, I think one of the things that's interesting to look at is, especially with photogrammetry, many meshes have become what I refer to as triangle dust. There's this bust I pulled off of the Smithsonian site. They have a nice scan repository that's 27 million triangles. So, you know, triangle meshes are universal, but they're um, painfully inefficient. Kind of as a result of that, though, there, you know, the, of this insanely high resolution, there is a huge amount of redundance. You know, their high quality means that they're really, really smooth, um, you know, when they're smooth. I mean, occasionally you have sharp corners in a mesh, sure. Normals are probably redundant because the geometry itself captures the, the uh, surface itself. And they're absurdly local, uh, meaning that all of the vertices are very close to each other. And Obviously, we've seen in, in the last couple of years, folks very much exploiting this, um, but hanging on to their UVs and using conventional textures. Kind of in the context of this whole question of, you know, whether meshes survive, there's there are some issues in terms of, you know, for specifically for huge meshes, rasterization is linear, so you've got to have level of detail because it's got to be screen space dependent, otherwise you're going to die. Uh, you know, you'll, it'll really hurt your performance. Ray tracing is logarithmic, but to ray trace, you need to be BVH and the BVH build is linear. 
and the space is linear. So there's some serious things to overcome here if you want to go to very, very high quality, high resolution meshes. And then there's animation to just further complicate matters. But what do we really want to do? I mean, like, what's the goal here? Um, you know, I heard Aaron Lafon at various points talk about, you know, wanting to, to produce photorealism. And, and I think as an industry, to some degree, we want to not just render things, we want to simulate them, um, you know, simulate reality. And you can't even, it's, it's utterly, you know, infeasible to think about authoring things, about, you know, armies of artists creating stuff. Um, and, you know, getting back to this animation question, some of it's also gonna move. So like, what are the alternatives if you can't actually sit down and create everything? You need, you know, procedural methods, neural methods, you know, sort of higher level primitives that allow you to, um, to actually synthesize geometry. I mean, like this picture on the right has got lovely complexity um, in terms of near field, far field, um, where the details are. And, and all of this seems to boil down to, you know, kind of a, a question of efficiency if you want to render this stuff um, in real time. You can imagine neural methods for a field of grass, but once you get close to the blades, you need some kind of hard geometry. And I guess another thing, and I'll touch a little bit more on this later, you know, we're not gonna get, uh, probably not gonna get uh, doublings of performance over the next N years. So are these higher level descriptions sufficient for the current scene or do we need some sort of caching system? And if you do, okay, what form do those things take? Um, you know, so to get onto the second question, are triangle meshes dead too? Well, as a medium for creation, I hope it's clear that they're horrible. Um, at, at the same time, well, horrible, maybe it's a little strong. Lots of people still um, push triangles around. As a representation, it's pretty basic, it's universal, and they're actually, you know, at, at, at the down at the transistor level, they're very efficient. Um, so maybe as a cached representation, they're gonna have to stay around for a long time. Um, you touched on sort of API and this whole question of putting things in hardware, whatever it might be. And I want to emphasize something that, you know, periodically frustrates me is that, you know, hardware isn't magic. It's not a silver bullet. You know, hardware versus software doesn't change comp computational complexity. Um, though if you can afford the gates, um, you know, sometimes brute force is, you know, if you can get greater efficiency by, by building custom hardware, then good things can happen. But then there's this question more broadly about introducing something new. Um, and I'm particularly sensitive to this. And I actually had some variant of this slide, I think 10 or 15 years ago on a panel at HPG in LA, although maybe it wasn't called HPG at that point. But, um, I've termed it legacy lag. It's basically, there's a huge amount of uh, customers and hardware out there in the world that people target. So if we look at DX12, it's um, at 90%, has sort of a 90% install base right now um, after seven years. DXR, you can look at the Steam survey. I didn't dig into it too far, but um, something less than half the GPUs out there are very ray tracing capable. And I'm, it's a little bit of a uh, a negative comment about all of the hardware that's out there because I don't think all of it is, you know, it says it's capable, but it's actually not. Um, so, you know, as a company, how do we think about making architectural investments where you might say that's a hardware investment? You know, as a, as a company, we sell GPUs. That's the idea. It's like how we make money. Um, legacy game performance drives sales. That means you need to have faster GPUs and the legacy stuff doesn't use the new thing that you want to put in this new piece of hardware. At the same time, you know, revolutionary tech, revolutionary tech can drive sales with, with customers. Some people do buy something because it does something new, even though there's very little out there that actually uses it. And then I guess also to understand is over half of our market at this point is non-gaming. Um, so, and then there's this problem that game developers also have to target a market and that market at the time something is launched, new piece of hardware is launched, 
is the existing installed base that doesn't use this new thing. And again, thankfully, there are, are game developers out there and you know developers in general who are really interested in new tech. Um, and then there are these other effects like, oh yeah, if you actually want to get this thing to be used across the industry, you need standards. And lastly, the console business has a huge effect on what game developers in particular will pick up. If it's in a console, it gets used. So um, I think this is probably my last slide. And I guess encourage people to look at this a little bit because it's interesting. There's a great talk um, by Jim Keller. Um, it was a talk given at Berkeley called Merge Law is Not Dead. Um, but what we're experiencing these days, at least based on the current ideas and the current technologies, is you can get more transistors, but they cost at least the same amount, if not more. So you can't, I mean, for the last like 30, 35 years that I've been doing this, um, you know, we had this huge ride from technology where we got a doubling of performance and we're not getting it anymore. So you've got to do more specialized and kind of targeted hardware. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Henry. The second speaker is Jonathan Lecuy from Unity. Muted? I'm not muting anymore, so here I am. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, so I'll continue. So I'll just uh, start again with the, the questions we were asked. So is there a realistic path to UV-less graphics and therefore are 2D textures dead? And assuming 2D textures are dead, then are triangle meshes dead too? So I actually, when thinking about this presentation, I broke down these questions into essentially two parts. There's this red part, is there a realistic path to UV-less graphics? And then the rest of it is a bit, is more or less related to death. So I <laughs> separated it <laughs> for uh, a later discussion. So let's start with this first uh, section. Is there a realistic path to UV-less graphics? So when we talk about UV-less graphic, my understanding is to look at what we mostly have in mind, especially at Unity, is if you want to texture uh, a, a polygon mesh, uh, so cover it with uh, some surface attributes, you'll need a UV map where you're asking your artists to unfold the mesh into a quad domain, and this quad is discretized into a texture that is sampled uh, from the hardware. And unfortunately, as yes, uh, William said uh, during uh, our uh, HTEC presentation, this is super tedious for us and it's, uh, uh, it produces discontinuities that are very hard to handle, especially if you're doing displacement mapping. Um, another, th another thing that William mentioned in his introduction was that artists at Unity hated doing UV mapping and I actually conducted uh, an internal survey among uh, some uh, artists. We have uh, colleagues of mine, actually. And yeah, so they unanimously don't like it, to say the least. And one thing that was uh, uh, interesting, I thought, was that uh, Sébastien Lachand, who's a, a tech artist uh, who's working in Paris, also told me something that I hadn't necessarily realized, is that he's, he's currently dealing with uh, super high poly meshes uh, that uh, count up to millions of polygons, and he's, he has to do the UVs by hand. So he has to place uh, millions of vertices by hand in his square domain. It's huge. It's a huge amount of work. So given that artists usually don't like this, there's room for technological innovation because you can expect some adoption because you already know that the artists, the, the guys who are responsible for content creation, will probably at least have a look at it. And I really want to insist that this is actually a real uh, questioning I had. And Alex uh, made this joke that I, I thought was funny because it, it really is true that their sentences look like Yelp reviews, but there are real answers. I can assure you that. Um, the other point I want to make is that actually UV-less graphics already exists, uh, not on the GPU, but in uh, production. So there's uh, PTEC, that is actually Disney's uh, standard texturing method, and it's really used everywhere. So just uh, as a quick reminder, you have this uh, quad, uh, quad only mesh, and you apply a texture to each one of these uh, faces. And these are slides that I took from uh, Brent's uh, uh, Brent Burley's uh, uh, slides from the uh, PTEC presentation. And one thing he, tested, he uh, insisted on was that the artists were really keen on this, on this uh, 
particular technique. And we are actually in the re in research uh, pretty familiar with this uh, representation because we recently had the uh, Marana uh, Island that is made out of quads and uh, P-TEC textures. Uh, so this is a close-up of a specific area of the scene and every square here corresponds to a P-TEC texture, so a unique texture that has to be applied on the, uh, on the surface. Um, one also interesting fact is that actually, well, maybe Henry will uh, contradict me here, but it's, uh, as far as I remember, um, I think Henry was pretty keen on pushing this particular extension, which allows you to sample the uh, texture, not at the usual textile location, but at their dual location. And this would allow you to do some, uh, some mesh color filtering or PTEC-like uh, implementation. And uh, a quick mention also about non-quant meshes. So um, most of the times for production assets, artists are used to uh, create quad only meshes, but sometimes they'll add a few triangles here and there to complete their mesh. And if you have that, then how do you, how do you, how do you deal with that? So one solution is to use HTEC, which is the paper uh, uh, we presented just before, or you could also use mesh colors. Um, both solutions are viable. I would uh, only say that uh, HTEC currently maps better to uh, current hardware units than mesh colors, but this, again, is something that is constantly evolving, so who knows, maybe in the future, there'll be both, uh, so both viable solutions. Uh, I'll skip this for now. So yeah, uh, so is there a realistic path to UV-less graphics? My answer is uh, yes, definitely. So p -Tech is a proof of concept. It's used again everywhere for every Disney production from modeling to uh, the final render. So then I'll move on to the question, are 2D textures dead? So I think that there's um, like some sort of um, confusion here is, well, you can think of textures as the thing we see on the left here, which is essentially an, uh, the, the view that an artist would, would have. And then there are additional formats. So here on the right, I'm showing the HTIC format, which is a tight bay format. And um, it's not that uncommon if you're a developer coding a game engine, because you've probably written a virtual texturing system, and you're already dealing with these texture tiles. So there's a duet, there's, uh, I'd say, an overload between 2D textures from the artist pers perspective and the, uh, what the actual engine will support and uh, use for fast rendering. Uh, so yeah, are 2D textures dead? I don't think so. It's just that we're forking, well, we are, uh, we've overloaded the word and there's a view from the artist perspective who's used to the UV-based workflow and the game engine developer who thinks of it of tiles of memory that he can move around from disk to memory to G, uh, uh, graphics RAM, etc. And then the final question is, is assuming two textures are dead, then are triangle meshes dead too? So for this, again, I'll insist on this uh, overload, uh, overloading uh, effect, where uh, what ha usually happens is artists usually deal with quite only meshes, but then if you look at the state uh, of the art rendering uh, technology like Nanite, for example, you can see that they, they're rendering super high quality uh, geometry, but they're made of triangles. But if you're an artist and you're modeling uh, some, uh, some assets, you'll be dealing with quad only. Only what, he see, the, what your artist will see on the screen is pure triangles. It's only abstracted away. He does, he's not aware of it, but he can manipulate what he's seeing on the screen intuitively to produce the content he wants. So uh, yeah, a triangle mesh is dead. Two, I think that at user level, if you're an artist, they're definitely dead. You don't, you don't ever consider triangles. It's uh, highly discouraged. Uh, but at hardware level, we still have our good old uh, triangles that we can rasterize and ray trace super efficiently. And yeah, that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. The next speaker is Ryan Schmidt from Epic. having me um, and uh, okay so let's get started so hyper we're, we're here at the high performance geometry panel um, and our questions that were posed to us uh, were is there a realistic path to UV list graphics uh, I think you know there is a realistic path we've just heard two people explain lots of options there's you know lots of other things out there too like distance fields and nerfs and all sorts of things 
uh, that don't have UVs that are sort of coming in the future. Uh, so then the second question was, therefore, are 2D textures dead or are triangle meshes dead too? Uh, and my answer is no, they're not. Um, now, I'm a bit biased because uh, in my sort of work at Epic, what I do is I make modeling tools for modeling with triangle meshes specifically. So even not quads, just triangles. Um, but essentially, uh, my the reason I say no, uh, a hard no, is that geometry representations never die. So we have triangles now, we'll have triangles forever. Uh, I said we're building modeling tools in uh, Unreal Editor. We're building sort of triangle-based modeling tools. And the question that I keep getting asked probably on a monthly basis is if we're going to support NURBS modeling. Now, a lot of people in graphics research might think NURBS modeling is dead, but millions of people in the world do NURBS modeling via CAD software. Um, and so it's still you know, alive and well, NURBS modeling, and will also probably, probably be with us forever. Um, an interesting thing about NURBS, though, is that uh, most of us have probably never seen a NURBS surface. We know what it is, but we've never seen one because they're always rendered as triangles. So a uh, sort of realization I came to some years ago was that essentially NURBS, the sort of math formalism, is a user interface for creating a triangle mesh. Uh, similarly, tools like ZBrush, which have a sort of amazing hierarchical multi-resolution sub-D representation, um, is ultimately, in most contexts, converted to a triangle mesh on export uh, into some other software. So you could also think of ZBrush as a user interface for creating a triangle mesh, and basically all DCC tools, because they go downstream to renderers that render triangles, uh, sort of ultimately become a user interface for tri creating triangle meshes. Um, or, you know, maybe quad meshes, as was just mentioned, but those quads usually get rendered as triangles. <laughs> uh, and, you know, you might feel that you never interact with those triangles, but in fact, uh, I can tell you from having made triangle mesh modeling software for the past mm, 10 to 15 years, that there's a lot of people out there interacting with those triangles directly. Uh, I'm going to borrow a slide from Brian Karras, who's going to be a keynote speaker at the SIGGRAPH uh, event in August. Uh, this is a slide from one of his other talks about Nanite. And I really like this slide. He said, triangles are the foundation of computer graphics for good reason. Uh, here are some of those reasons. Uh, you know, Triangle meshes are trivial to read and write and process. We basically all understand them uh, very quickly. Even non-experts can understand a list of 3D positions and a list of indices that are collected into sort of tuples where each one defines a triangle. Uh, you can write them out by hand. You can uh, create them manually uh, sort of by typing in numbers. That's all sort of plausible with triangle meshes. Uh, we also have extremely well-developed math for triangle meshes. So there's sort of stuff you know, that is very common, like things like barycentric coordinates and barycentric math, but also more advanced things like Laplacians and discrete, ex discrete exterior calculus are far more developed for triangle meshes than they are for any other representation. And those math formalisms allow us to do operations on those triangle meshes that start to be hard if you don't have them available. And of course, uh, we have amazing hardware support for rendering triangle meshes. Uh, texture maps, also trivial to read, write, process. They're just images. There's a, you know, a million image libraries out there. You can use simple formats to represent pixels as a list of three floats. Uh, they're easy for non-experts to understand, again, and to create and edit all the same things you can kind of say about triangle meshes. Uh, they also have extremely well-developed math, again, things for image processing and filtering and all sorts of good stuff. Uh, and they also have amazing hardware support, both for rendering in 2D and for rendering in 3D as part of texture map triangle meshes. Uh, and I would argue that this stack is very efficient and flexible. Um, you know, that you could argue about inefficiency in some ways or inflexibility in other ways. But what I can tell you from observing uh, over the past few years I worked at Epic, observing our in-house artists and tech artists sort of use and abuse texture map triangle meshes, they can do amazing things with them uh, that start to become very hard to imagine how they will do those same kind of things as efficiently uh, on the, sort of some of the other representations that are out there. Uh, and yes, UVs, they're annoying, but they're also great. You can do all sorts of horrible UV tricks. Uh, UV maps give you a sort of decoupling. Essentially, UV maps allow you to decouple these meshes and texture maps. And that decoupling is one of the sort of great flexible points in terms of flexibility for this sort of stack of, of things that we use so heavily in computer graphics. So basically, 
uh, my feeling is that the texture map triangle is it's become you know over the past decades the closest 3D analog we have to the 2D pixel. Some people are not going to agree with that, um, but the reason I say that it's basically our most basic building block for 3D geometry. Uh, sorry, voxels. Uh, voxels aren't the 3D analog to a 2D pixel, as far as I'm concerned. Happy to happy to further discuss. Uh, nobody asks if pixels are dead. So that you know, in the same way, I don't think texture map triangles will ever be dead. Uh, of course, other things are great too. So you know, artists will ultimately use whatever tool best suits the job. And you know, someday that might be an, an, an SDF or an implicit or a nerf or a you know a PTEX textured quad mesh. And that is that case already in certain contexts. Uh, and I hope that happens because you know I started out as an implicit surface person many years ago. Um, we use SDFs all the time uh, in terms for processing meshes. It'd be great if they were all equally well supported by hardware and all of the math was equally fully developed for all of them, and they were all as sort of easily interchangeable. Um, but you know, texture map mesh technology is not standing still. So this is a screenshot from uh, our Matrix Awakens demo that uh, was released um, earlier in the year. Uh, right, this is on screen at least hundreds of millions and possibly even billions of triangles, instanced triangles. Um, and it's part of an enormous city, uh, several kilometers square. Um, and all these buildings are triangles being streamed in and out of the GPU, texture map triangles. Um, and so far, I think we've yet to see, uh, this is all rendered with Nanite and with Lumen, our the sort of Unreal Engine 5 global illumination uh, system, uh, real-time global illumination. And I think, and I'm happy to be told I'm wrong, that uh, in terms of real time, you know, 30 to 60 frames a second graphics, the other available representations out there aren't able to achieve this sort of scale yet. And like I said, I hope they do. Um, but that's uh, the end of my little talk here. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ryan. Uh, the next, and we'll talk about that in a, in a minute. The next uh, presenter is David Farrell from Adobe. Right. Hello, everyone. Um, okay. Uh, my name is uh, David Farrell. I'm a software engineer at Adobe. Um, and so for this panel, we want to discuss. Uh, high performance geometry and trying to answer a couple of questions. Are 2D textures dead? And are triangle me uh, uh, meshes dead too? Uh, and so I'd like to use the, um, the application I've been working on uh, as kind of a case study to help answer these questions and, and share my perspective. Uh, so I, oops, let's see, there we go. So um, I work on something called Adobe Substance 3D Modeler, which is uh, currently in beta and uh, is just um, uh, was, was just released earlier this year as a beta. Uh, it's a sculpting and modeling application, um, and uh, it's what we call a hybrid application. Uh, and by that, we mean that it runs in both the 2D desktop mode, where you use a keyboard, mouse, and pin input, as well as in VR mode, uh, where you can use uh, six off controllers to uh, gesturally sculpt and model. VR mode isn't required for this program. Uh, it runs just fine with, uh, with just uh, desktop um, input devices. But if you have a headset, you can switch back and forth uh, between VR and desktop uh, whenever you want. Um, so here's some art uh, made with uh, Modeler. These are actually, to be fair, uh, these are made with uh, external renderers, but these, these scenes were made from within Modeler. Uh, and this is what you see within Modeler. Um, and the thing about Modeler that makes it relevant to this discussion is that it works with very, very uh, dense meshes. Um, what Henry Morton earlier referred to as triangle dust, I think referred, is applicable to, to what we're doing. Uh, so in a scene like this, um, uh, it's, it's sourced from about uh, 2.3 billion triangles. Um, there's around 3,600 instances of 132 unique objects. Uh, but because of the combination of instancing, LOD, and occlusion culling, we reduce that uh, that number down to roughly around 15 million. That actually, it's, it's more in the range of 10 to, to 20 million rasterized triangles each frame. And so as a result, we're able to render at, at uh, 90 Hertz in VR on a, on a uh, RTX 3070 uh, desktop class GPU. 
Um, and so this visualization shows a color-coded view of each of the instances in Modeler. Uh, the, um, the surface representation for Modeler uh, is that each the shared data of each instance stores both a signed distance field voxel grid as well as a triangle mesh. Uh, the voxel grid can be very dense. Uh, each of the individual voxel grids can be up to 1 million uh, voxels in, in each dimension. Uh, and those are stored sparsely using a two-level hash table. So we divide the space up into 256 uh, size cubes, uh, which are further divided into eight uh, cube size voxel blocks, uh, which then store per voxel assigned distance value and a albedo color. Uh, the key to this is truncating the signed distances to just the narrow band of negative two to positive two and not storing anything outside that range. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Modeler actually uses both SDFs and triangle meshes. So as you edit and sculpt, um, we maintain both of those data structures and keep them in sync. Uh, and so for the triangle meshes, uh, that is what we actually rasterize and render from frame to frame. And the way those are organized is that each 64 cubed block of the voxel grid has a small triangle mesh octree associated with it, uh, holding four LODs. Uh, and each vertex in this data stores just 10 bytes. Uh, we get away with that by storing the XYZ positions uh, in eight bits each uh, relative to its, its block's origin. Uh, and then we use four bytes for the vertex normal and three bytes for the um, RGB albedo color. Um, uh, let's get past that. Um, and so just to kind of give you an idea of, of, of what's happening very quickly, um, on, on the left, you can see the, the mesh clusters as they've been um, LOD'd. And on the right, you can see the occlusion culling, which is key to be able to render this kind of artist-generated content at, um, at uh, reasonable frame rates. And so uh, in Modeler, the triangle meshes are not just used for rendering, though. Um, uh, although it's an SDF-based Modeler, we also use the triangle meshes for several tools. Um, and so here you're seeing the warp tool, uh, which actually operates on the triangle mesh data and takes the section that you have deformed and then quickly converts that back to an SDF from which we generate a new triangle mesh. And we're doing all that very quickly. Um, and so this is an important aspect of Modeler that we use both the SDFs and the triangle meshes for sculpting operations and keeping both of the surface, surface representations up to date as you are editing. Uh, and so this is where I think triangle meshes are really useful, um, at least for, for our purposes, uh, because they're really excellent at deformation and, and um, you know, in a game engine, you have animation and skinning and so forth. And so let's get back to the original questions. Are 2D textures dead? Well, in Modeler, we actually don't use UVs or texture maps at runtime for the, for the sculpt. Uh, but when you export data out of Modeler, you export a triangle mesh into um, some triangle mesh file format like USD or FBX. And so at that point, we will optionally uh, UV unwrap the mesh for you. Um, however, to be able to do that efficiently, um, uh, we, we, we do have to uh, decimate the, the mesh fairly significantly. Um, and so in the future, uh, will we skip UVs entirely and have downstream applications uh, be able to use highly dense meshes with vertex color channels containing uh, different attributes. Um, you, can, you can do that in Nanite right now, uh, at, least, at least I think with albedo vertex color, and it actually works well. But uh, do we really want to do that in all cases? Um, I think there's, there's a lot of nice reasons to take an exported triangle mesh into another program, whether it's, it's into a Substance Painter or another uh, uh, painting application. Um, and as a, as a content creation, application, frankly, at this point, we can't be too opinionated about what artists want to do with their data after it's exported out of Modeler. And so our triangle mesh is dead. Um, I, think that the, I think that for the purposes of, of, of deformation and animation, um, they really are the best choice for being able to um, arbitrarily deform a mesh. Uh, and because of that, I think triangle meshes will, will be with us for, uh, for some time. Uh, okay. And that's uh, that's what I have to uh, to say. Thank you. Thanks a lot, David. So before starting the discussion, we'll conclude with the, the last presentation by Alex Evans from uh, from Nvidia. Hello. 
Well, hello, everybody. Uh, okay, I'm on screen. Um, uh, thanks for uh, inviting me here. I'm the SDF guy uh, for a long time uh, at, at NVIDIA. Anytime somebody said SDF, I would kind of appear on Slack like a golem. So um, if I say something that shocks you, all my SDF friends, I'm actually going to say some triangle positive things in a moment. So um, yeah, apologies to my SDF buddies. Um, so uh, I was thinking about high performance graphics before we get to the same questions. I'm going last, I was worried I'd, there'd be nothing more to say. And I was thinking, well, kind of geometry is already pretty high performance, right? Like um, uh, triangle counts are going up. And um, uh, as uh, Petri Klarberg at the HPG um, uh, keynote this year showed, like, you know, we can take um, 3 billion triangles and we can uh, do 30 bounds path tracing at, at 33 frames a second on a single GPU today. So we're already doing high, high performance geometry already. So like, I, you know, I was pondering, what should I talk about? Um, it's already solved, right? <clears throat> and uh, and the point is, I, I really like finely tessellated geometry. Um, uh, you know, they make a lot of a lot of things easier. That um, Henry mentioned uh, triangle dust, and like once everything is triangle dust, everything gets easier, right? Because you you can just use vertex or face colors. You don't need any UVs. You don't need textures. You can just tessellate over the hell. Um, and actually, culling and LOD become much easier because everything is so uniformly tessellated. Everything is so tiny that you can take extra trees and those sort of things. Um, and anyway, these days you want to get most of your surface, you know, variation from the geometry. So the textures are often very simple, um, or they're just detailed maps. Um, but the problem is that as soon as you go to like finely tessellated um, world, uh, it puts a lot of pressure on all the boring bits of your code, right? So you start to hit memory limits, like loading a billion triangles. And I'm so thankful that we haven't really covered this so far in the talks. But for me, this is actually the biggest single hole for getting to like this world of polygon dust world of getting billions and billions of triangles and you need you need things like streaming you need you need um um a lot more complexity and worst of all is the content creation as jonathan mentioned there's kind of two views you can have the view of the content creator and you can have the view of the engine programmer the graphics researcher writing a paper um who tends to focus on the runtime performance but actually the the, the performance of these things uh when you're editing is a huge deal. And like editing UV maps with millions of triangles is, is, is horrible. Um, and so who cares about lo uh, loading and saving time? Well, the problem is nobody does. And so like, I'm half trolling here, but who's doing the most important work in high performance geometry at the moment? Is it Aris uh, XUNT? Maybe, because he just uh, landed a change to Blender, I believe, uh, which uh, reduced their OBJ load time for 7 million triangles, which isn't even that heavy these days, from 239 seconds to 18 seconds. And if you ask, the artists what the experiences of working with these kind of um, heavy meshes. You know, we all talk about like, yay, we can do like a million triangle meshes now, and we can do photogrammetry, and we can do nanite, and we can do these things. But actually, the, the artist workflow is absolutely miserable, right? They're all dying in the corner trying to pull the UVs around for these million triangle things. Uh, thank you for setting me up, Jonathan. And uh, yeah, so this is this is actually super important. Um, and actually, I think this is the greatest contribution of nanite as well. So like hats off to um, the Epic team. Uh, and, and people talk about the micro triangle rasterizer and the and the, the sort of the the pixel end of nanite. But actually, the most interesting thing about nanite is that they did all of the boring bits. They did this end to end system that um, gets gigabytes worth of triangle meshes into the right place at the right time at the LOD you want. You know, they exploit the multi gigabyte per second SSDs we have. Right? They are blowing even Aris's new OBJ loader absolutely out of the water. And what we need to do, and that my you know. I'm for everyone, and I embarrassingly am not working on this right now myself. So this is to myself as well. In the mirror, Alex, we all need to be working on making the experience of working with very finely tessellated meshes way better because it, it, it's not good right now. Um, and so you might expect the answer to the questions to get to the kind of, you know, what's dead, what's not dead. You might think like, yeah, we don't need to do UVs anymore. We can just tessellate everything to, to dust. But actually, in reality, um, as other people have already said, so I won't labor these points, parameterizations are a super useful tool. You just know, you know, there's no need to bend them. They're, they're a great tool. And um, uh, we need them, uh, especially in content creation. Um, and we can distinguish between the creation workflow, which probably will have UVs for a long time to come, and the delivery, the, pick, the, the triangle dust, which potentially could just have vertex colors. Um, and, uh, and, and you know what? Does that mean textures are dead as well? Definitely not. I mean, they're just images, as other people have said. I mean, maybe these kind of charts are going to go away. And um, I hadn't actually seen the HTEx uh, paper before uh, writing these slides. But you know, HTEx and PTEx before it are great examples of how maybe old school charts are going to go away. But you know, 2D textures as images and gradients in a procedural pipeline, absolutely, they're not going to go away. Um, because you know, we're going to be building brushes, detail maps, decals, 
all these sorts of things, and everything is going to be procedural soup. Um, I think, as Henry mentioned, like you know, at some point you need to create this digital dust rapidly, and that doesn't just mean from the disk and the network. That can mean procedurally. You know, like in the film industry now, it's a standard time to build cloth out of individual hairs, which are like you know modeled in Houdini or whatever tool it is. And and so we're basically dealing with procedural soups. And we need to find quick ways to texture them, and 2D images are not going to go away as part of that pipeline, even if it all gets baked down to vertex colors in terms of the final delivery. And you know, I had to include a slide about other representations. But I am the um, SDF person, so my previous work, uh, I worked in a game called Dreams at PlayStation. This image on the left is um, it shares a lot of DNA actually with um, uh, Adobe's. Uh, substance uh, modeler that you just saw. So, so imagine that, but on a PlayStation. Um, and these this lovely filling with breakfast, there are no triangles here. We uh, Unlike our substance, this is pure SDF, uh, ray marched directly on the um, compute shaders and pixel shaders. Um, and so that, you know, so there are no triangles, UVs, there's no unwrapping. It's literally uh, a color per voxel. Um, and, you know, you can get some great results. And, you know, I've recently been working on instant NGP and NERF, and do I think these are useful? Yes, but they're not going to replace triangles. I just think that um, because we have this zoo of alternative representations, they will all find their niches. But um, you know, measures as other people have said, but they're just not going away. Um, so uh, just to summarize, this is my last slide. Um, I think the future is going to be basically highly tessellated. I think that's the key. And what I want to implore everyone to think about a bit more is once we're in a highly tessellated world, you know, as, as researchers, we can notice five million poly mesh and wait five seconds and it doesn't matter. But when you're loading like that every day or you're loading tens or hundreds of these meshes, the load times and the, and the iteration times become uh, pivotal and, and deathly. And so I think we need to, we need to improve that. Okay. Um, that's what I have to say. Thanks a lot, Alex. And thanks to all the speakers. We have to offer thanks for playing this little game with us. Uh, you, you did well. We are obviously all working for the Triangle Lobby. And uh, I, I can see that uh, all of you uh, kind of agree on uh, on the fact that triangles are around for a good reason. The interesting thing is that you didn't pick up the same reason. Like each of you had a different, uh, found useful in a different way, triangles today, and same for textures, 2D textures. So I'm going to open up the discussion. But before, I try to quote maybe one, one thing for each of you that, that you have been stating. Henry mentioned that we cannot expect the, the hardware to, to double in perf, in performance, in the next few years just such as we experienced maybe in the past, which might be actually what may drive us in believing that the future will be going on and on on the resolution side. Jonathan mentioned that uh, actually uv is already here and used in a specific industry, VFX and animation, not yet in game, but we are currently working on that. And if textures might disappear, texture types, for instance, might stay around for a long time. Uh, Ryan sees any other representation as a form of interface to triangle meshes. I love this, because that, that's actually not completely wrong. And that's, uh, I, I tend to agree with that. But I don't try to uh, voice my opinions here. We have the speakers, and they are here to, to answer your questions, guys. So please ask your questions on the side while I'm summarizing this, uh, this exchange. Uh, David has been pointing the interrupt between different representations and has shown a great example of how SDF and triangles can be uh, together and underlining another use of triangles, which is true, it is for, for the formations to be, uh, it's very handy to define the formations with triangles and other representations are actually hard to um, to come up with when it comes to precise deformation. And finally, Alex, first of all, thank you for your keynote at EGSR last year, because I think it kind of sparked the question between Angel and myself about the, the topic of today's uh, keynote. And we wanted to have like the opinion of various leaders uh, in the industry. And uh, you, you pointed out at several moments that in the workflow, the main problem might not be the one we think about, but actually loading a mesh might actually still be the number one problem we, we need to solve. So that was a very quick summary. All of you guys have been uh, sharing with us a lot of other thoughts. Fortunately, this is recorded, and I'm sure many students will have a chance to actually listen to that, even those who are not attending today. And uh, I'm going to go with the questions in order and uh, ask my own questions in case we, uh, we empty the list. And so I will start with a question asked by Andrew, actually my co-chair, who's actually extending the question to all of you to testation. So is real-time testation dead? 
in, in the context of everything you have been showing and discussing today. So short answers. And uh, the first one of you who want to say a word about it is welcome to start. No. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it comes down to definitions also, right? It's yes. like, okay, what do, you, what do you mean by tessellation? Do you mean hull shaders and tessellation shaders? Those are probably on their way out. Yes. Mesh shaders, people like those. What about in the context of ray tracing? Nothing exists. Um, you know, and how does tessellation exist in the context of a BDH? That's a, you know, BDH is like triangles. Um, and maybe some other things someday, but right now. All right. Okay. I think that uh, answers a part of the question. Other comments about this? I'm a tessellation guy, so I, I, I could comment on that, but I won't. I think, Tammy, you have a great paper on real-time tessellation recently, no? I believe the name of the paper is called Tessellation Free, <laughs> Displacement yeah. Mapping. Which right, okay, okay, all right. From that. But yes, well, I that's, that's all right. So if tessellation doesn't result in triangles that you store or rasterize, does that mean they don't exist? It's like not tessellated? Ah, it seems to me you're tessellating. That's a philosophical question somehow. Yeah, you're right. I don't <laughs> you have an intersection. <laughs> All right, let's uh, maybe move on to the to the next question. So uh, NERF and uh, neural models have been mentioned by several of you. Uh, and someone is asking whether, uh, because NERF is like a vast zoo of like many, many different kinds of techniques from all seen to actually textures, uh, or at least like shell space uh, reflectance models. So what when you refer to NERF, like for those, those of you who have been referring to that, do you see them as a substitute to UV textures? And uh, we know over the last two years, there has been a bunch of papers that, that actually try to do that, to replace the SVB RDF with uh, actually a, a neural representation. And are they good only in cases of microfibers, which, turn, which in turn have to be tiled? Yeah, so that's about like how new representation can coexist with the existing ones. I'll, I'll bite something, which is that um, looking at back to the tessellation and actually telling your paper, like I think that there's a path forward to these kind of crust-like um, where you have an underlying 2D shape and then you basically extrude it and you do something within that. And there's a few papers that are doing kind of height fields and rediscovering, you know, like parallax occlusion mapping and these old techniques, which are like not quite triangles, as Henry's saying, like the triangles don't quite exist, but you, you ray march them or you do something. And for me, Nerf, uh, yes, there's a volume rendering part of it where you very much and you, you have some neural representation, but it's really about um, the neural side is more about the content creation or the, or the compression of the resulting volume. And I don't know exactly which compression scheme or representation scheme will pan out as the right one, but I do think that there is going to be scope for these kind of dis displacement plus plus or on the fly displacement. These kind of techniques that, that, that exist in shells, I think will have some, I hope they have traction because I love, I love the look of them and I hope that they will. They will land. I don't know if they will, but I hope so. Actually, I know Serban was attending HPG. Serban was the original author of Shell Maps, uh, Seagraph 2005. I don't know if he's here, but uh, he's here. <laughs> so that's great. Great work. Great work. Any other comment on this? Nerf are all, all around the place these days, so I'm sure everyone has an opinion about it. I, I, I actually have a question on that topic. and given that there are other people here who probably uh, know the answers. What's, I guess, what's the trade-off between calculating these uh, things from first principles versus um, caching them, you know, running from frame to frame and have a running cache versus, like, I don't know what the efficiency trade-off is between triangles with textures and nerf models, for example. Does that question even make sense? It does. Yeah, it, yeah, it's a hard question though. I think it depends on what, at what, at what scale you switch to Nerf. Or like, like I think that as a from a graphics researcher perspective, I see Nerf as a kind of a, a continuation of volume rendering, and it, it's almost like it's removed the stigma from volume rendering because it's trendy. We can now do volume rendering again, and um, so I, I see it entirely in terms of like, well, we could have covered these things in gigavoxels, you know, Cyril Krasnan's work. But it wasn't, it was sort of verboten because it, it wasn't fast enough and it wasn't like su supported by hardware. But now nurses have come along and basically given us a new, fresh, 
view on how to compress these things a bit more heavily and how to capture them from the real world. But fundamentally, your question, I think, is best answered in terms of like, how should we cache volumes? And it's like, well, there's Pixar's Britmaps and there's Gigavoxels and there's, you know, potentially tra online trained nurse. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I think different people will choose different points in that in that spectrum of trade-offs. Because And your, your question is as vague as should we do volume rendering? And my answer to that is always emphatically yes, but it's yes. difficult to, yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, before taking the next question, I'm going to extend this question because uh, I noticed in uh, all your talks that uh, several of you, pretty much all of you, have referred in a way or another to this notion of cache or intermediate representation for which hardware considerations and, and actually performance imposes representation as low level as texels and triangles. So from the fact that Ryan was considering that the interface to triangles are nerves or like any other representation is actually an interface to the fact that actually polygons to rasterize remain the fastest thing we can do today. It looks like this could be also a, a new status for triangle meshes and texture maps to not be actually the, the, the DCC output, but an automatically defined and generated layer in the stack, which brings the question of hardware support of the higher level representations. Now, a bunch of you have been working on, for instance, subdivision support on the, on the GPU. Uh, SDF are now a big thing in, uh, in DCC. Same goes with NERFs. I'd like to, to extend the question and ask you whether you think that another, a second level of repre geometric representation would make sense on the GPU, on graphics hardware in the near future. So, one of the problems that we run into with triangle dust as the lingua franca is building BVHs. So if there were a higher level representation that had similar efficiency to triangles that didn't have the BVH cost, I mean, I think I'm under the impression that Nanite runs into the same problem. They do a spectacular job of bringing, delivering right size triangles for rasterization, but building BVH with Nanite is a little bit more painful, especially if it's happening frame after frame. So there might be room for something that helps with the ray tracing problem in a sense. I don't know. I'd love to do the perspective from uh, Jonathan, Ryan, David as well, because you guys are in uh, DCC content creation. Uh, maybe you are working at a higher level than, uh, for instance, in NVIDIA uh, in the stack. Uh, what's your opinion about the level of hardware support that should be provided to high level, higher level uh, representations? Uh, so I, I can start then. Uh, well, I think you would have you would you would need to have a primitive that can compete with triangles in the first place. Like uh, right now, surface meshes are really the the most intuitive thing for artists to use. Uh, so for I would say manual content creation. Now, if you if you look at more automatic procedures, you would have perhaps point clouds and other data structures. But for whatever is created by artists, and that's in the case of Unity, that's the the most uh, important, uh, um, the most pr prevalent kind of asset. Uh, the we don't have a replacement for for surface mesh. We don't have a, a competing primitive. Uh, for for meshes and what's also I mean there's authoring but there's also rendering and there's also level of detail I mean uh, uh, we can we can do a very good level of detail with uh, meshes up to a certain degree after which uh, volumetrics uh, representation could kick in and actually just to kick back to the previous question that we still have this uh, big challenge to to solve where. We don't have a unified representation between volumetric and surfacing. Uh, when we when we're rendering surfaces, we have a dedicated uh, rendering uh, algorithm, and when we're doing volumes, we have a, another uh, uh, renderer that basically kicks in. And you have these two backends to support, and they're, are, they're not compatible with each other. We still don't have voxels that can act as um, surfaces and that can mid map so, so as to create three levels of detail. And we don't have, obviously, triangles that can behave like volumes uh, by definition because they're surface elements. Um, so, yeah, I mean, as long as we, 
triangles, are, well, not really triangles, but surface meshes are really uh, a super, super versatile primitive. And it's, I think it's going to be hard to, to compete with that. So we'll have a, a zoo, like I, I liked Alex, uh, Alex's um, uh, formulation. We'll have a zoo and alternatives. But at the end of the day, you'll probably have some meshes in there, especially if you have artists modeling, you know, manufactured stuff like cars and, and you know, industrial things that you always find in games and uh, in movies as well. Um, I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure I have a great answer to this question. I, I, I personally was very sad that tessellation shaders never really took off and the idea of having a sort of multi like a multi-scale representation for meshes, um, which is maybe maybe uh, you know if, if it's if it's triangle dust at the finest level, what I would like to be able to send to the GPU is something a little bit coarser than the triangle dust, plus the instructions for turning that into the triangle dust. Um, most services, like something we've seen with people using Nanite, is that the there's the in sort of intrinsic shape doesn't require millions of triangles. Um, you know, and that's, you can see like how many, you know, almost all sculpting tools where people create those super detailed models, you have a hierarchy of base meshes. And at some level you're adding like fine grained detail to a base shape. And we don't really have a way to give that to the GPU, even for a surface mesh, right? That, and tessellation was the sort of closest thing. Um, and, uh, you know, it sort of it never took off, um, which is just sad. I had big plans for tessellation, but I'm still waiting. But but Ryan, the I mean, like the the fundamental problem with tessellation shaders was that they were creating these triangles procedurally that were going to be rasterized in a few pixels. So they were fundamentally inefficient for a, a GPU rasterizer. And with Nanite, you you kind of came up with a, a different tessellation scheme that's actually super efficient for micro polygons. So having um, the with... base the base data for Nanite though is the high res mesh, right? It you, you, okay. you know, as Alex was saying, and it's a real problem, the millions of triangles import. Um, yeah. I mean, our artists who are using Nanite have to import those millions of triangles into Unreal Engine. And they come to me and complain about the import slow and it can be rendered yes. really fast, but they are imported very slow. And I always have to say like, well, we don't have a special processor designed specifically for importing files. Um, but uh, yeah, Nanite right now, builds off of those high, like you have to have the high resolution triangle mesh and it builds from that. Mm. I think in, in modeler, um, well, in terms of hardware support for high level surface representations, one of the, um, one of the, the nice things about the way that modeler is set up is that, that, that all those voxel grids are, um, are voxel grids, and so to generate BVHs from them, uh, it's, it's it's very natural to kind of operate on voxel grid boundaries. Um, and in that sense, it's operating with with volumetric data, but it's it's more volumetric data that captures the the geometric surface uh, detail. Um, and uh, it's 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 very natural to to, to subdivide <clears throat> along those those boundaries and generate triangle meshes, generate your triangle dust from from that. Um, but, uh, but, but, but generally, I think that that's, um, I don't think that that's something that, that should be done by the hardware so much as, 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 as just performed with, uh, with, with a lot of, of compute power. Um, the only thing that would come to mind is if, um, if there was a, a way to accelerate um, hash table operations <laughs> so that 3D, 3D, um, 3D lookups and so forth could be as, as fast as a 2D texture lookup. But uh, obviously, there are very good reasons for uh, for for uh, for that being uh, more more complicated. And since Alex is working at Nvidia and a big SDF fan, maybe he's working on that. Yeah, well, I, 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 I've been on SDF holiday for a while, but you never know. Um, I, I, one thing I was thinking about was uh, Henry's uh, legacy thing. And I, uh, there's this adage that, like, if, in the absence of any extra information, you should assume that everything is halfway through its life. So, like, this, this panel is about what's going to live and what's going to die. And it's like we've had triangles for 30-plus years, so we're probably going to have them for 30-plus more years. We've had Nerf for one year, so, you know, I want Nerf to live a lot longer than one year, but the point is that it, it, we shouldn't we shouldn't fall for recency bias or whatever it's called. But we should we should assume that the tried and tested things are going to live 
uh, for a long time. And um, I'm actually pretty comfortable with this idea that we that we have like great triangle pipelines and great texture pipelines. Um, and then all the other things to serve as like amplifiers or ways to augment um, graphics in general. So like, you know, the tools that we're all creating and the papers that we're all writing serve to kind of boost the, the quality. But yeah, in the end, we're never going to lose the things we've had for 30 years. I, yeah. Thanks, guys. Um, I think we still have time for uh, a round of answer regarding the last question that is on the board. Guys in the attendance, please do not hesitate to ask more questions. We, we can probably sneak one, one more. And the last question is, uh, which do you think would be the next big ways to break the, me the memory barrier wall other than H HBM? So a rather low level question in terms of hardware, but at some point uh, loading, I mean, <laughs> loading assets is also a, a memory problem, a memory speed problem. So I don't know what's your opinion about that, guys. I, I, I thought about the question after listening to Henry talking about uh, using like smaller elements instead of triangles, right? So if you go with that kind of architecture, you're going to need massive amounts of bandwidth, massive amounts of memory. I can't see any other way of doing it. And well, I think memory technology isn't there yet. Sure. Um, I guess a couple of comments directly about the question. Um, I mean, basically, innovation in memory is driven driven by economics. It's also and get to some degree, de 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 uh, driven by physics, but um, in the in the sense that can we deploy so much floating point horsepower that we can't actually feed it with the bandwidth that's available? As long as things stay reasonably balanced, it doesn't matter. I'm not an expert on uh, memory technologies, so I can't, or you know, or low level signaling interfaces, so I can't speak to that. But to your comment about. Um, you know, uh, triangle dust and the implications of that, that speaks to me as a compression problem. Because um, one of the things that I observed and that, that Nanite explodes, ex explodes, ex exploits um, tremendously is that in these very, very richly detailed models, there's also a, an absurd amount of redundancy. And, you know, it's a hugely, it's a great target for compression. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, they, I think eventually, especially for transmission of assets, storage of assets, that compression technologies like Nanite um, and, and others that may emerge make lots of sense. Because um, certainly a, a, a raw triangle mesh is an absurdly, um, you know, it's like universal, but it's also absurdly inefficient. And, and I think that speaks to Ryan's point of like, he was longing for a triangle bit, bit, a bit coarser than the dust and then have the instructions to, to generate the dust. And that's exactly the same thing that Henry's talking about, the compression. And I see compression as like one simplistic data point in a sort of spectrum of, of anything that's procedurally generated, right? Compression is just one form of procedural generation. And you could actually see all sorts of ways of, you know, like the old school fractal landscapes, you just add noise. And that's, that's like, you know, 10, parameters and you get you get a whole landscape and I think that that this on the fly generation from some parametric model and compression and all the space within that and there's last I wanted to point out that there was a paper at HPG yesterday I think that the uh, billion point uh, cloud rendering paper and I think it's telling that in terms of what they contributed on top of previous work it was mostly that it was a compression thing right they were like oh we've realized that we only need to store 10 bits per per coordinate and so we can we can cut the bandwidth in, in a third and so this is already happening. Like we're already seeing the research, which is essentially, hey, look, we can do compression to, to, to improve the performance of these very high you know, triangle dust or point dust in that case. So yeah, generation and compression plus one. Yeah, part of the um, reason I mentioned the sort of like some kind of way to generate the triangle dust is that uh, one of the things that I think is is getting you know incrementally worse over time in in graphics is our ability to do uh, like what we need for something like a 3D sculpting tool where uh, we don't know ahead of time what the shape is and it's changing every frame and not in a structured way, like with a skin mesh or something where we can do it on the GPU. Uh, I mean, sometimes you can do it on the GPU, but basically there, you know, compression would make it slower 
essentially, right? You can't afford to compress it to send it to the GPU and have the GPU be smart about all the things it's smart about, like in in, in the Nanite rendering. Um, we, you know, it it's getting harder and harder to build interactive tools that can handle these huge amounts of data because we can't get them to the GPU, but we need access to them on the CPU. We're just not trying hard enough. You're right. You're right today, but I hope you're not right. To, you know, in the yeah, future. me too. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, it's funny. You, there are a couple of things that I kind of react to there. It's not an accident that Nanite stores topology at like four bits per triangle on disk and stores it more like 17 bits when you're actually trying to interact with it in rendering. I mean, this is documented in the slides. It's not like I'm saying anything that's news. The other thing to Alex's point about you're not trying hard enough, most of the dedicated hardware that you would build for subdivision surfaces or any number of high level primitives, it's really better cast as a dedicated software problem I mean, Nanite's rasterizer, it's compute rasterizer is a great example of this where hardware doesn't actually make it any better. Um, you know, and it's, when you start looking at things like subdivision surface evaluation, the amount of floating point involved in that to do it quickly is just crazy. And you would never delay down that floating point other than make it available in a processor that you then program. So like dedicated code that does sub D evaluation is the thing that you ultimately want. And it's also a lot more flexible, but someone has to sit down and work hard to make it work well. Um, so they, the idea of dedicated hardware for new primitives, it's got a really narrow sweet spot where it's not so expensive that you wouldn't want just more horsepower in the processor. And it's not so stupid that it can't actually do anything useful. Anyway. I would dare to make a comment here. Uh, I have a feeling that we are moving more and more toward a program-based representation of assets. And it speaks well to the compression problem, because then the, the complexity of the assets and what can be managed in memory in a reasonable amount of time is proportional to the uh, Kolmogorov complexity, actually, of the, the underlying graph that defines the process that produces the texture or the, or the shape. So actually, on the fly decompression on the GPU, is, I think, a, a, a really interesting topic uh, for future research, which means that for DCC, for people who are creating tools, <laughs> I <think pressure. laughs> I'm hearing a dog here. <laughs> I think the dog was was agreeing with me. And that's perfect to actually conclude this, uh, this question uh, moment. Uh, we don't have any more questions. So I'd like to thank all of you guys for taking the time to share your your opinion on that. A big round of applause, please, everyone. And uh, I, I encourage everyone to join the social room to continue the discussion in, uh, in 101, so in small groups. HPG will continue tomorrow with an amazing program. Please check it online.